Chapter 10, Invention Through Procreation as Conflation. In Crete, to become masculine, a young man needed to have sex with another man. Yet having sex with men is now seen as a sign of effeminacy and tolerated only for that small minority. We know the culprit is culture, but just how did this dramatic transformation come about, negating the sexual fluidity of pagan times that assumed same-sex relationships as part of normative male behavior to equating same-sex relationships with only an effeminate minority? Defining procreation as the proper goal of sex changed all that. It would be easy to place the blame solely on Genesis for focusing on reproduction. Quote, as for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on earth and increase upon it, end quote. However, Stoic and other pagan sources started the procreative craze within Greco-Roman culture centuries before Christianity infected the West. Take this from Masonius Rufus, quote, Men who are not wantons or immoral are bound to consider sexual intercourse justified only when it occurs in marriage and is indulged in for the purposes of begetting children, since that is lawful, but unjust and unlawful when it is mere pleasure-seeking even in marriage. But of all sexual relations, those involving adultery are most unlawful, and no more tolerable are those of men with men, because it is a monstrous thing and contrary to nature." End quote or this from Plato. Quote, As I said, I have a method for establishing this law, and the law will prescribe that men use sexual intercourse for procreation, as in nature, that they refrain from the male, if they are to avoid intentionally killing the human race and sowing their seed, as it were, on rocks and stones, rocks and stones where a man's fertile seed will never take root. End quote. This focus on procreation explicitly singles out all same-sex acts as wrong because none of them can result in children. While not, while not all opposite-sex sex results in children or is proper according to other rules, many can be rectified by a shotgun wedding. As such, the Old Testament is less harsh on opposite-sex sex. This is why a rapist has to pay a bit of money and marry the victim, all in the service of procreation procreation, quote, if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay her father fifty shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives, end quote. However, the rule against the same sex, against same sex sex is simple. Leviticus was written in the same procreative spirit, but the letter of the law Mets, uh, mets out harsh punishment for same-sex sex. Quote, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. End quote. Christianity, Christianity synthesis, procreative prescriptions with Levitical punishments, created the concept of bad homosexuality, all same-sex sex is non-procreative sex, and good heterosexuality. Even opposite-sex sex gets rounded up to good procreative sex. This was the fundamental shift from the sexually flexible Greco-Roman world. These ideas were forcibly applied in the 300s with the Christian takeover of the Roman Empire. The sexual ethics and punishments inherited from the Old Testament began to be imposed on all. Initially, the old pagan ethics that allowed for sexual flexibility but socially forbade citizens from playing the role of the receptive partner were kept but updated with loving Christian punishments in 342. Quote, when a man submits to men the way a woman does, what can he be seeking? Where sex has lost its proper place, where the crime is, uh, when, when the crime is one, it is not profitable to know, where Venus is changed into another form, where love is sought and does not appear, we order statues to arise and the laws to be armed with an avenging sword that those guilty of such infamous crimes, either now or in the future, may be sub subjected to exquisite penalties, end quote. Notice that only the receptive partner is noted as erring, per Roman custom, albeit with a severe punishment, per Old Testament custom. All that changed for good with a law from 390. Of the, quote, of debauchers, Moses says, If anyone hath intercourse with a male as with a woman, it is abomination. Let them both die, they are guilty. 
This indeed is the law, but a constitution of the emperor Theodosius followed to the full the spirit of the Mosaic law, end quote. What's the difference? The difference is that the 342 law punishes only the penetrated passive partner in anal sex, hereafter known as the fucked, not the fucker. We still see the last vestiges of the old pagan sexual ethic whereby a free Roman citizen could have sex with another man without bringing shame upon himself as long as the free male was not the fucked, the same restrictions did not apply to lessers like a slave or prostitute. Well, it was a long time coming, 390 then is the crucial moment that the sexual ethic changed from fluidity to prescribing exclusive heterosexuality to men and thereby inventing its opposite. Not only does this obsession with procreation create the concept of homosexuality, but its subsequent criminalization also decreases the number of same-sex relationships. Fearing death or imprisonment, over the following generations, fewer and fewer men would be into what had been, uh, what had been before commonplace. It then began to look natural that, that man only had sex with woman, as everyone began to forget that such restrictive sexuality was an artificial imposition backed up by force. Though the concept of fluidity never quite left us, fundamentalist Christians often think gays are recruiting or one may be cured of homosexuality. The next millennium, and then some, offered not much new. That men only liked women became the default view since same-sex acts became rare through criminalization and what few men committed such unthinkable acts were put into the detestable sodomite category. Onto this category, with the assumption that most men liked women, Carl Heinrich Ulrichs transposed his gay effeminacy, equating effeminacy with same-sex sex just like what science tells us today. While some may see his coinage of the modern terms homo heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual as radically innovative, Ulrichs did nothing new. He merely created the terminology for a system that already assumed most men liked women only, while a minority of six sodomites lurked about. His only innovation was to argue that gays should be accepted because they are born that way, effeminate and same-sex attracted. And because they are born that way, the biblical prohibitions, particularly in Romans 127, did not apply. Quote, How will I prove that St. Paul did not mean earnings or gaze in Romans 127? Very simply, by the apostles' own words. They read, Leaving natural use of women, they were aroused in turn by a longing for their own kind, males practicing foul lust on other males. The words natural use and leaving do not apply to earnings. For the use of women is not the natural one for the earning, nor has the earning left it. End quote. Ulrich's argument explicitly threw most men under the bus. Quote, However, both do apply in the case of the urinaster or pseudo-homosexual engaging in situational homo homosexuality, i.e. the dioning heterosexual male who seeks intercourse with men due to, due to the lack of women or by choice, or also says the popular argument as a re result of self-abuse." Ulrich's argument mirrors science. Both assume that non-gay, i.e. masculine men engaging in sex with members of their own sex are fakes. This circularly kept the masculine men out of the newly coined homosexual category. Masculine men became confined to the straight category since they are only situationally homosexual. And what man would want to be associated with effeminacy anyways? Ulrich's circular binary fallacy assumed that since he's different from men because he wasn't masculine and that he liked men, masculine men must be the opposite. They must only like women. But why can't masculine men like other masculine men, or feminine men, if the claim is that heterosexual men like feminine women? If cats like tea, it doesn't mean that dogs can only like coffee. Also, his argument reinforced the very idea that created and demonized homosexuality, uh, i.e. that procreation was the only legitimate focus of sex. Ulrichs meekly begged for an exception because it was not in the nature of gays to reproduce. Not surprisingly, his loophole was undermined by the same procreation ethic that he dared not touch. 
The medical book of the time on sexual maladies, Psychopathia Sexualis, argued that proper sexuality is procreative, quote, the propagation of the human species is not committed to accident or to the caprice or to the caprice of the individual, but made secure in a natural instinct which, with all conquering force and might, demands fulfillment. In the gratification of this natural impulse are found not only sensual pleasure and sources of physical well-being, but also higher feelings of satisfaction in perpetuating the single perishable existence by the transmission of mental and physical attributes to a new being." End quote. Since same-sex sex is not procreative, it's still wrong. The book is subtitled with, quote, emphasis on contrary sexual feeling, end quote, the euphemism for same-sex sex. Contrary, because it is opposed to this proper sexual feeling, procreative sex. The heterosexual maladies it mentions are mostly non-procreative fetishes like spanking or cross-dressing. And there we have it. Sexual orientation is then the product of focus on, focusing on procreation, ignoring innate male sexual fluidity with minor improvements from the first gay guy. Kinsey slabbed two gradations, both to the left and right of bisexuality. And that's why sexual orientation fails as a universal theory. It does not explain anything outside our culture and only that if we clumsily sweep under the situation at situationality rug all the counterexamples. It does not explain pagan sexuality, nor does it explain the grero in other cultures. Far from describing our natures, these sexual labels merely describe our culture. The politically correct LGBT label shows the artificial conflation of the heterohomo system. Standing for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, LGBT sometimes gets appended with a few more letters for queers, intersexuals, and asexuals, or LGBTQIA. While the acronym wants to be inclusive, it is not just a modern version. Is it not just a modern version of the bad sex category of non-procreative sex of yesteryear? It is. The only commonality of those considered LGBT is that they are not heterosexuals. But how can one be part of a group if that group is defined negatively? What does a lesbian talking about her vagina have to do with masculine men who like other masculine men? Doesn't the cultural bias show when one is defined to be part of a singular freak category that in reality has a huge amount of variety which only gets ignored because the overriding factor in identity is one's lack of conformance to the predefined normal? Compare to the now defunct word colored. The word too ignores the variety in the artificial grouping itself and sets white as the golden standard. Why? Culture. Science does not accept the Bible's mistaken categorization of bats as birds just because of analogous but not homologous wings through convergent evolution. Neither does science accept the classical elements but rather the periodic table of elements. Yet when it comes to sexuality, science accepts the cultural propaganda that same-sex attraction constitutes a singular small category of mostly effeminate males and ignores the historical evidence of male sexual fluidity. Science should accept neither the conflation of all, all varieties of same-sex sex under so-called homosexuality, nor the validity of sexual categories that descend from a moralistic focus on reproduction. Science does not allow for moral high horsing with phrases like periods of moral decadence, constant struggle between natural impulses and morality, or Christianity is one of the most powerful of the forces favoring moral progress, yet science still accepts the subtle results of these pur puritanical proclamations. We should recognize that in the absence of our currently restrictive sexual ethics, most men would have no problem loving other men. Ghosts of empires past rematerialize. Tomorrow belongs to us.